Hi everybody, I'm going to show you how to be useful in the morning and how to check out your machine. So the first thing that you need is to make sure that you have your emergency backup system. So if a patient were to roll into the OR right this second, what do I absolutely need to take care of their airway breathing circulation? Well, first thing I would need is an Andrew bag. So make sure that you have an Andrew bag, like so. And you can see this one's actually either connected to oxygen. And it comes with a bag like this. And if you're, you have a mask there as well that you can plug it in. And sometimes there's an extra pop-off valve to give extra pressure. But you always want to have an Andrew bag ready so that you can bag mask and a patient and get auxiliary oxygen. So you can see there's oxygen ports back here, but you also have one on your machine right here. This is your auxiliary oxygen where you can connect anything to and hook it up to 10 liters and connect an ambu bag if you needed to. Now let's say that emergency patient started vomiting vigorously and you need to manage the airway. The first thing you're going to need is suction, okay? So in many operating rooms, you will see um, you can follow me back over here. Sometimes they have a suction canister port type of device over here that you want to put to continuous if it were to work and it's connected to a canister like so. I'm going to show you this one happens to have one right off of the machine. And so it's very important that there are no cracks in the lid, that this lid seals tightly. And it even tells you here, vacuum, that says ortho, and this says patient. So you want to make sure that the caps that are on here plug everything up that you don't need. The vacuum is tightly in there. And this is the patient port. So if this was here, I'm going to take you back around. I'm going to take my suction tubing, okay? And oftentimes you'll have a kit of everything you need to set up your OR. This little piece here is extra, but save it. It's very useful sometimes. And this here is going to connect in you can see over here, I can hardly see, but this is going to connect here to this patient and the other tip is here and I can make sure this one has a suction port here I can turn on to max. I can make sure at each step of the way that there's suction from the, the canister to my tip here. See how it's holding my finger and I can connect, this is called your yank hour suction handle. So this is going to be what you connect, and in theory, when that patient starts vomiting or has a bloody airway, you have suction to clear the airway. So the three components of that emergency system were the ambu bag, an oxygen source, and suction. Now you can see how I pinched off this tubing here so it doesn't make a ton of noise. And sometimes people have created a little area like a syringe barrel to put that in so it stays quiet. So now that you've done your emergency system, we're going to move on to the high pressure system. You can see it says system power here, so I'm going to turn that button on first for system power. Every machine is different, but basically you have to turn it on. Now we're going to wait a minute. And while it's loading and coming up, the high pressure system is how all the gases come into the operating room. So you can see over here, there's various pipeline colors. This is how the gas comes into your OR. And green is for oxygen, yellow is for air, blue is for nitrous, and this purple one is for waste anesthetic gases. So they come in at a high pressure of 50 PSI, and they come into your machine, and I'll show you on the back of the machine also, You'll also have backup tanks. So this is your green again is oxygen, yellow is air, blue is nitrous. The air one is actually closed. And you can see that I have a little wrench here of sorts for this air one. See how it's zero? If I connect this wrench and put it here and open the tank, it rises and I'm gonna close that off again. And same thing, the oxygen tank here is at a thousand, which you can tell me why I know that that's about half full. So these are your backup tanks. We have had to use those. There was an entire oxygen failure in the hospital 
in the past year where it became very critical to use those oxygen tanks, so it's important to know. So let's talk about the low pressure system now. So we went from the high pressure system where it was 50 PSI, it dropped it down to 25, then 14. In theory, when you're checking out the low pressure system, you want to make sure there aren't any leaks in there. And you're checking out whether or not if you turn oxygen off, the nitrous will rapidly fall with it, the bobbins move slow, uh, smoothly, and the vaporizers, if you turn each one on individually, um, that they don't have any leaks. From the low pressure system, we now move to the breathing system. And you can see here that some of these items here, they're asking about the breathing hoses. Are they correctly connected? Well, this is your breathing hose right here. And you have an inspiratory and an expiratory lens to your circuit. And it's actually conveniently labeled on this machine. It says EXP and expiratory valves. So it'd be something you can observe. And it even has a nice little sticker that says filter. So this is the bacterial virucidal filter for uh, Riley. The ones we have at university are actually circular. But this is going to go on this side here. And that protects the exhaled gases, whatever's going back. It protects the machine from germs. So we've got one side of our circuit going this way and one on the inspiratory lid here. And you will notice this little nub in here. It's a very convenient place to put this one if you're trying to do a leak test. Uh, breathing circuit here. Is it fully assembled, correctly connected? This is my breathing bag. So in spontaneous ventilation, uh, this is going to act very similar to the patient's lungs. So we were talking about the high pressure system. We talked a little bit about the low pressure system and the breathing system. When I think of breathing system, I think of oxygen and CO2. You breathe oxygen in, you blow carbon dioxide out. So the next step here is um, if you were to have an oxygen sensor, um, do you have one on this machine? Sometimes it's internalized, but in some machines they will actually make you pull out a physical oxygen sensor, leave it open to air for three minutes, and then put it back and make sure it's calibrated appropriately at 21% and 100%. This machine probably does it for you because it's all electronic. For CO2, you have here a sample line, and this is going to connect here to your gas analyzer right there. Sometimes there can be a filter in it because they're trying not to have too much moisture in it. You can see they nicely labeled this one to give it an expiration date. And this is going to connect, this is your Y piece on your circuit. So sometimes you may have an elbow, which is just going to be a 90 degree bend. This is actually a flexible connector here. And you have an area for you to insert your CO2 monitor that way. And this would then be placed and connected to a patient back. So when you're checking out the breathing uh, circuit and system, the other part with CO2, sometimes you may or may not see people through their mask blow into the CO2 monitor to make sure that it has a waveform on your screen. But you also have to worry about your CO2 absorbent. And so this is the particular absorbent here. You can see that it's white. It has a pH indicator that you can read about for the different colors when it has uh, exhausted its ability to remove CO2 from the system. And every system is a little bit different. This one comes with a full canister. Many of them have some sort of flip or latch uh, to pop it open. And then to similarly slide it back in and put it back. Sometimes you may find that some people are actually pouring the actual bags of this desiccant into the um, canister. I've seen that at Methodist Hospital. So that's your O2, that's your CO2, that's your breathing system. Then we have to think about the ventilation system in and of itself. So when you have the ventilation system and you want to trial it, you can actually connect your breathing circuit to your bag and turn on some vent settings. Um, so this is just volume mode here. Um, and you can see 
it's calibrating the O2 by itself, so this machine doesn't need that. Um, and if you have no gas, it's letting you know that. So we're going to turn on some oxygen and make sure that on volume control, and I'm going to turn off the nitrous there, and I'll just show you right here, if I were to turn off oxygen, watch the nitrous, see how the nitrous came down with it. And see, if I try to turn on nitrous and oxygen is not on, it does not turn on. If I turn the oxygen on, if I turn off the oxygen, nitrous also goes. That's a safety precaution. So you can see that I've set a tidal volume of 100 and I'm able to give 100 uh, on a minimal fresh gas flow of, say, 1 to 2 liters uh, that I'm able to reach my set tidal volume. So this is how you're going to check out your ventilation system. Uh, so we've gone through emergency system, high pressure system, low pressure system, breathing system, ventilation system. Uh, then we have our scavenging system. Once you have gases and things coming through your circuit, uh, you want to make sure that you're scavenging it appropriately. And in this particular machine, you can see that there's a little red bobbin, and it's in between the black lines. And this little black valve here can kind of change whether how much you're suctioning out the waste gases from the circuit. So we want that red bobbin right there. Sometimes it's a little smaller black bobbin of sorts, or sometimes you just see the purple waste gas pipeline coming up. So we've done the emergency backup system, you've done the high pressure system, low pressure system, breathing system, ventilation system, scavenging system. Now we're moving on to the monitoring system, okay? So here's where one of your patient monitors, you're gonna turn that on right there. And you can see there's a bunch of different cables coming out. And these are all nicely wrapped. So if you look up the standard ASA monitors that you're interested in, you're gonna have, we've got pulse oximeter, and this here is gonna connect to a pulse ox sticker. We have our blood pressure cable, and this will connect to a blood pressure cuff. And then you also have your EKG leads, which I think here we have, you can insert some leads in there with patches on the pump skin. So you can see it says EKG leads off, you'll have a pulse ox, you'll have blood pressure, something that you're gonna to wanna to be cycling every few minutes as you go through induction. Uh, and moving onwards. So I'm going to take you over here so you can see what you need to have prepared. Since we are at Riley Hospital right now, you have a pediatric pulse ox sticker, but they have adult ones as well. This is an adult blood pressure cuff. You may want to have different sizes. And you can actually see it gives you directions for when you need to use a smaller cuff and when you need to use a larger cuff. So you can look up the different guidelines for what, how to appropriately size a blood pressure cuff, and that's especially important for pediatrics, I'm sure. And here's a pediatric sort of the lead wires that would go in, and these little buttons would go on your EKG, uh, EKG leads. So they call these leads sometimes, they sometimes call these uh, leads as well, but uh, these will snap onto the patient's chest. And if you look up the proper positioning, if you have a five lead EKG, People often remember it as white on the right, over green, and then smoke over fire, which is black, over red. And the brown lead is the precordial lead that preferentially should be in the V5 position. And I'll let you go ahead and look up where that is exactly so that you're monitoring for ischemia. And we also have a temperature probe here. This is a skin temp probe. You will often see people take the sticker off and place it nasally but we also have esophageal temperature probes. There may be temperature probes that are in the skin or also in the Foley as well. So here's an esophageal temperature probe that would go down the socket. So that's a conceptual framework to how to think about the overall machine check when you're preparing for your day. The emergency backup system, the high pressure system coming in to the low pressure system, to the breathing system, to the ventilation system, scavenging system, and then monitoring system. 
So every anesthesia machine is going to be different, but some of them actually give you an electronic guideline of what you're supposed to do, and you just have to follow through those steps. So in this particular case, they've talked about the pipeline pressure and the cylinder pressure, which is part of our high pressure check, and they talked about opening those valves and, importantly, closing the valves after the check. They've asked if the O2 flush is functional, and that's this button here. Yep, you can see it's working and you can hear it. Auxiliary oxygen flow meter functional, and that's the one here that we were checking as part of our backup system. Breathing hoses, are they correctly connected? Yes, because we put them on ourselves. Are the vaporizers correctly locked in position? Yes. Are they set to zero? Yes. Is the fill level okay? You can look at these monitors here of how much gas is in them. And is the safety filler locked? I believe that has to do with this thing here. You don't want this open. Um, breathing circuit, is it fully assembled? Yes. Is it correctly connected? Yes. Is the gas scavenger connected and the flow adjusted? That was the bobbin we talked about previously. Um, CO2 absorbent, okay. Yes, it looks like it's white. It's not purple. It's not filled all the way through. Water trap fill level, okay. So this is part of your water trap in here. You don't want the entire thing to be soaked because you'll start to get some inaccurate readings and some blockages in your tubing. Is the suction okay? Yes. That was part of our emergency backup system. Emergency resuscitator present and functional. That's going to be your AMBU bag. We've already done that. Prepare for the self-test now. So close all the flow controls. These are all off. Connect the sample line. This is connected to our circuit here. And it says, um, occlude the Y piece. So remember I showed you there was a little nubbin right here that you can occlude this here. And some people may or may not connect the sample line depending on the machine. So we're going to go here. It says APL valve check. That's the adjustable pressure limiting, va limiting valve. We're going to set this valve here to 30. It says press O2 flush until breathing system pressure stabilizes. It should not exceed 45. So here's this pressure gauge, and here's that oxygen flush button again. And so I'm going to press it, and you can see that it doesn't go higher than 45. It's pretty much at 35. Okay, so it says release O2 flush. Pressure shall not fall below 15, and it's at 25, so we're good there. And it says lift to APL valve, and you want to see that the pressure releases all the way to zero. There's no obstruction there. Uh, now, another way with your circuit closed off that you could, in theory, close your pop-off valve all the way, increase your flush up to, say, it's at 35 right now, between, you know, 20 to 40 there. You can see my bag is very full, and if I were to push on that and apply some pressure in the system, it doesn't drop below the 30 where it started. So there's no leak in that system. So we are now going to start the actual self-test the machine asks us to do. So we're starting that there. And you're going to just let it run through the system and the electronic checks and make sure that everything internally in the machine is appropriate. It will actually probably give you a number for your leak test of what volume is uh, leaking. And you'll just want to see that all the little green lights turn on our green. So this is a good time while your machine is doing the self-test. You can see it takes approximately three minutes to run through whether or not you have everything for your case. And frequently people will use a mnemonic called MS Maze that you may have heard of. And we're actually going to repeat some of the things we already did. So the first M is for machine. We just did all that. That's the machine check. The second one is S for suction. Okay, and that's part of our emergency backup system. We did that as well. The next one was M is monitors. And so we, that was part of our monitors, monitoring system. We have that. So when we're talking about airway, A is for airway. Depending on your case, you may just be doing an IV sedation case and you'll just need some oxygen nasal cannula with a CO2 line port that you can stick through here and monitor their breathing that way. If you're going to be doing any more invasive airway techniques, maybe you just need a laryngeal mask airway 
which is a good thing to know where that is anyways, because it's um, part of your difficult airway algorithm in the ASA as a backup. And if you're planning to intubate, you'll need a handle. You can see this is a disposable one here. Here's a reusable one. You'll need a blade. This is a Max 3 blade here. And you can look at the differences between Max and Miller's. There's lots of information online. And you can see that it comes together at a 45 degree angle here, like so. And then it snaps open and you can see a light. Okay? So you can check to make sure that your light is functional. You want to have an endotracheal tube of the appropriate size. You can look up the different guidelines and rules for um, sizing, especially for pediatrics. But you'll generally see something between seven and eight, six and a half and eight for men and women on adult size. You can see I'm going to tighten that connector there. And when you look at your average endotracheal tube, you can see there's a cuff, there's a Murphy's eye there, there's a little pilot balloon that's wrapped around it. And I'm going to place this metal stylet, and I'm going to make sure that it stops. I don't want it to go through Murphy's eye, and I don't want it to come up through the end of the tube either, because that could cause injury. So I'm going to back it up, and right where it's before Murphy's eye, I'm going to kink it so that it cannot advance any further. And you can see many people will put a little bend on the tube if they're using a stylet. Or you may find that some people choose not to use a stylet at all. And I'm going to take a 10 cc syringe on the pilot balloon and I'm going to deflate the cuff entirely because I don't want to put anything larger through the vocal cords than necessary. And I can actually check my balloon if I want to and blow up the balloon here. And you can see how it's inflated and there's no uh, holes that would create a leak. So I have my tube ready here. I also have a backup, this is your backup oral airway, and maybe a nasal airway if necessary. You might want some lube if you're gonna do that. Maybe some four by fours. You'll see people vary in their technique of creating some sort of soft bite block. Um, to have ready so that patients can't bite down on their on their breathing tube. They'll bite down on a bite block, which will protect and maintain the patency of their ET tube. So that's my airway stuff. So we were talking MS maids, machine, suction, monitor, airway. So I is for IV. So sometimes you may have a nice handy dandy little IV start kit, but if you don't, you can create an IV kit with a tourniquet, a four by four or gauze, in case you have any blood you need to wipe up. Something for antisepsis, like an alcohol pad, and an array of IV catheters. Now we have a few here, and I'll let you take a look at it. And something you can do when you're on the OR is take a look at the different sizes and drip rates and try to understand the differences between your 24, 20, let's see here, 24, 22, 20, and 18 gauge and in adult, you may see 16 and 14 as well, which are gray and orange. Uh, but whatever appropriate size IVs that you think you might want to try to get, and then you can wrap that up. And sometimes you might have a connector of sorts or a second IV bag that you've set up. You can see here in pediatrics, they're frequently using a Laris pump tubing, which means you can set a rate for it. Uh, this little blue plastic piece is a good indicator that it's something that can fit into a pump. Um, or you may have other sorts of tubing that you see and that they spike. So I wouldn't spike anything without talking to your resident or staff first because you don't want to waste things. Uh, but you'll frequently see lactated ringers used in liter bags for adults. Um, there may be cases where you want normal saline or plasma light as well. So that's IV. And then the last component is drugs. And then S is for something special. So as far as drugs go, you can take out syringes sometimes and label them with stickers without drawing things up, um, depending on whether or not you've discussed this in advance with your resident or staff. Um, and as far as anything special, that'll be things like central lines, arterial lines, peripheral nerve block, needles and kits and ultrasounds that you want in the room, neuromonitoring, Sedline, this, um, those sorts of things that are extra for specific types of cases.
But there you have it. That's how you set things up. You can see that um, this device is tested and ready for use now. So you want to do a machine check once a day in the morning, and especially on Mondays after a long weekend, check through everything, especially your desiccant, your CO2 absorbent. And then in theory, you need to do a leak test between each case because you have a new circuit for each patient and you want to check that circuit out for each patient. But that is how you do a machine check and help out in the OR. If you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you.